Welcome everyone to the May Plurivisal Design um, Book Club. Uh, this is a really exciting one. Um, well, before I'm gonna, we're gonna start off with our hellos and everything. One, so I'm Leslie Ann Noel, um, one of the co-chairs of the Plurivisal Design Special Interest Group, and I'm gonna pass it over to Renata to introduce herself, and then Mariana. And then Hi, I'm Renata Leto, and I also another co-chair of the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group of the Design Research Society. Mariana? <laughs> I am Mariana, I am a designer, and I am also a co-lead of the Pluriversal Design Book Club. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> yes, welcome, everyone. Um, today, we have a really special guest or, well, he's going to tell us where he's zooming in from, right? So, Dr. Pierce Arthur Hogile Gordon. Oh, no. Okay, let's oh, try no. again. I'm just going to hand it over to Pierce, who has an amazing energy. Pierce, introduce ourselves, uh, yourself, teach us how to, how to pronounce your last name, tell us all about you and the book that you're going to present. So, over to you, Pierce. Let's do it. Okay. Hello. How you doing? For folks that have not had deep expertise in using your tongues towards Southern African languages, what I would suggest is that you call me Dr. OG. Make it simple, easy, nothing, right? Um, and it, there's a brand thing there that, that people love talking about. However, if you would like to try, my name is Dr. Pierce Otrohile Gordon. Otro Gordon. So double bear my name. We just got, we got married last year. We love it. We, we try to vibe. It's a pleasure to have you all uh, here. Um, I am a, I wear a lot of hats as I'm sure many people do in this meeting, um, but the main professional one I love discussing over the past year is serving as the director of the Equity Innovation Studio for a management consulting firm in the States called Think Rubix. Um, we are part of, uh, we have three separate studios focused on engagement, uh, connecting with people in uh, all types of grassroots organizing and political campaign activities, a storytelling studio that focuses on um, work in um, branding, asset development, uh, strategy auditing and the like, website development and all those pieces. And my piece uh, built very much so from my own uh, PhD work at the intersection of innovation and practice, evaluation capacity building and international development to build as knowledge assets to help people um, use research, design thinking, systems design, uh, curriculum design and engagement and facilitation towards issues of equity inside organizations um, for their internal and external activities. Um, I'm calling in from Botswana and I'm very happy to be here. Should I stop there? Continue, the floor is yours. We will listen to you for the, if, until 1 p.m. Eastern so you can do anything you want for this hour. <laughs> That's dangerous. That's <laughs> dangerous. Okay. Um, I want to clarify a piece of information for how you all hold court in this space. When you put the hand up, does that mean you're, you're, you want to be called on or is that saying applause for what someone is saying? We're just going with the floor. I think they were just cap clapping you. Clapping is like applause, yes. that's it. So, hand, yes. so we can raise the hand and then you, it means that we stop and, and that person talks, but usually we are clapping. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time and space to discuss um, not only the fantastic book, this is a fantastic book and work from N.K. Jemison, but also to um, think about as a whole uh, the, the beauty and genius of fantasy and sci-fi writing towards building liberatory and pluriversal futures. Um, I want to tell you all where I'm at right now. First of all, shout out Fiona, who's also part of my uh, team, part of the Equity Innovation Studio in the chat right now, um, who Hi. I do a lot of fantastic work with. Um, but let me tell you a bit about what I'm de dealing with right now. I have a splitting headache. I got no sleep last night. 
Um, and I've had a back issue for the past two weeks. So I'm very glad that Leslie Ann brought me into this space to speak instead of other spaces because she the homie, we the homie, and because I know y'all are fantastic people um, building up this pluriversal design space. So if I don't come 100,000%, that might be the reason why. But let me tell you what we have planned for today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and have a slide deck. The intention is not only to just talk about, here's what's great about these sensational short story pieces and talk about this one and read this one and what, what have you. The intention was for me to say, here's why I love this work. Here's what I got out of it. Here's what it inspired for me from the, um, from the sci-fi and fantasy spaces in my own design practice, pedagogy and theory. Um, and then here's a, uh, a crash course activity I want all of us to engage in together to help shape some of the lessons I think are really, really valuable in these spaces to help shape our own design experiences. Are y'all game for that? Let me share my screen. Let's dive in. So thank you for having me here. This slide is not exactly what's going to happen, but it is a uh, a slide that discusses a lot of the things I've talked about before. And hopefully we can pose, peek those questions as well in how uh, we talk about the insights from, that I took from this book and other fantasy spaces in the future um, afterwards. Before I started, I wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the, the land that we are on, the uh, resources that we amass, the communities that we are part of, and where we are coming from to be able to do this work today. Um, I did. I don't know if you all can hear. There's a there's a loud voice in the back background of my work that is people politically advocating for folks, the different parties in Botswana. If it's too loud, please let me know. But I'm gonna keep moving. Um, just wanted to let you know. I acknowledge that that sound that might be happening. So I wanted to acknowledge the, um, the San land in which I sit, in which the uh, entire uh, country of Botswana and most of South Africa sits. It is very well known for being um, the, in many archeological and anthropological sectors, the beginning of humanity in our, in earth. Um, it is uh, an indigenous community that experienced many different multidimensional ex, uh, disempowerment and disenfranchise um, activities and the like um, to support um, the communities that I've done research with and uh, built relationships with as well. I wanted to honor and respect their land um, and all of the lands in which we are all sitting um, to uh, hold space for my appreciation for what they have offered us to be able to do this work virtually together. Um, so I'd like to take some space for everyone to think of um, the indigenous communities uh, from which they sit, from the land they sit on and the resources that they have um, offered sometimes been taken from them to be able to do this work. Thanks for that time. I appreciate you. We might as well dive in. So I, talk, I start a lot of my call talks with an awakening. And it's a different story that I usually like to tell. But what I want to do is tell a story from the book. I don't know how many people have read the book. Um, read any parts, any of the short stories, what have you. But I want to tell you, um, set the stage for one of them. I think the most impactful um, story that stays with me um, for most of the readings that I've done after and since. Um, so imagine, if you will, uh, a community connected on the internet. They're talking, um, it's, it, it looks like the 1990s or the 1990s, 95s, what have you, with people uh, connecting, not exactly a deep 
uh, culture of web 2.0 or 3.0 that's been amassed in the space, but people are having conversations about all types of things. Um, and you learn about how everyone is connecting and engaged and um, what people care about. And you realize some interesting pieces of information. Number one, that every single person in the space lives in about maybe a room that's about 10 to 20 square feet by itself, that, that, that is where they live. And about every like 10 to 12 hours, um, the timeline in that room resets. The people that they talk to are in different rooms that they can never see themselves. Um, you start learning that everybody, um, if they go outside of that room, uh, things look relatively normal, in, but there's no one around, there's no other people, there's no other animals. You go pretty far away from the room, it starts shuddering. It starts, it feels like it's getting out of sync, out of resonating. And you start realizing over time that the way that they're communicating with each other, these are all different pocket universes. Apparently, uh, a unknown government entity created um, a technology, uh, a, and tested it out, um, something related to black holes or the engaging with dimensions or uh, quantum accelerators, what have you. They ran something and then instantly people were separated from each other for the rest of existence. Um, and you start finding out about people's societies, how they're coping with these issues, people that were in existence and that aren't for some reason, um, and how our main protagonists are dealing with the, the idea of being isolated from everyone else and what that means for the future, for their future or future of the people that they care about. This was before COVID, you understand. Like this was, <laughs> I read it and I was like, this, this idea is so sick. This is like, how, how do you come up with this? Where did this come from? Uh, where, and during COVID, I just went back to the story and recognized how, how resonant it is, not only from um, the, what the characters are experiencing, but the themes of how people are engaging with each other and what it means, I'm not gonna ruin the story, when people actually connect with each other and how that affects the realities in which they sit. Um, do they become connected? Do they pop out of existence? Who knows? I'm not going to tell you. Go read the story. It's utterly amazing. And this is one story of many that is told in this, um, in this short story asset. Um, I can start with talking about um, N.K. Jemison, a uh, sensational author that's put out many different resources, some of which you've seen on here. The main things that I, I believe she's most well known for um, is the Broken Earth trilogy. The first three, uh, three books that you see up on the top, the fifth season, The Obelisk Gates and the Stone Sky. I read it and I was like, this is one of the best pieces of, of fiction I've ever read in my entire life. Again, this is this is not the book that we're going, the asset that we're talking about today. This is just that piece. Um, I read her comic book, Far Sector, and I know of a few other pieces, but I haven't read everything that she's was constructed. Um, she's won, been nominated for, and won many different awards, the Hugo Awards, the Nebula Awards for her work. She actually, I'm not sure if she's the only one that's done this. She was the first to get the Hugo Awards for every single year in a trilogy that was for the Broken Earth trilogy. It's fire sensational, check it out. Um, but also I realized when reading, I started with how long till Black Future Month when engaged with her, because for me personally, as an academic, you, you get a chance to read as much as you can, you, you're inundated with content, but there were short stories. There were little tidbits, little information. You didn't have to dive into it and invest in a massive story and you could pick it up and go back in and get a cohesive narrative all at once. Um, that's what I loved about it. And that's what I continue to love moving forward. Um, I really appreciated though, the conversations that I found from her um, when I realized that she also teaches world building classes. 
This, what you're seeing right now, obviously is a GIF, GIF, however you want to say it, of a course that she teaches on YouTube during the Wired 25 Summit on how to build a world. If you haven't taken it, go, go, don't go after this call. <laughs> go, don't go during this call. Go after the call, go onto YouTube, look for Wired 25 on world building. And she, as an expert of the field, um, gives you an idea of all of the pieces that need to be put together to make a world in a story. Um, I was hooked, as you might expect in the design space. It is um, a lot of the thought processes, the facilitation measures, the, um, the outcomes of what makes a story created in the world building space very much so aligned in the design world. Um, and I, I, I go as far to say now that um, doing any type of liberatory work um, valuably must encase in itself some of the teaching from world building specifically because of what I learned from her course. Um, I'll say a little bit about that here, but um, I don't want to take away the thunder from her work. She also has, if you want to uh, support her in her work, she also has a master class available on how to write science fiction and fantasy, and she talks about world building in that space as well. Um, this is a little bit about me. I said a little bit about who I am and what I try to accomplish a bit more about that is um, I like describing my work at the intersection of transformation and liberation. Um, and it's been uh, through doing dissertation work and uh, afterwards applying it in here in Botswana on the Botswana innovation ecosystem um, from my research and um, design consultancy work and some uh, activist work in the Bay Area as well. And uh, through my firm and afterwards, and a little bit earlier as well, um, through some of the work I did when I was in Botswana, working at a makerspace, um, supporting uh, STEM, technical education, entrepreneurship, and artistry um, for the North Little Rock and uh, Northwest Arkansas areas. Um, so that's isn't that doesn't matter as much about me, about who I am. What we're here to do today is to um, not only laud over the work in this book for the folks that haven't read it, um, but also to talk about how uh, sci-fi and fantasy can help us as designers imagine better worlds. So what I wanted to do instead of going deep into many of the stories and what have you, admittedly, it's been about a couple of years since I read absolutely every story in them. I dove deep for this conversation, um, but I wanted to talk about some of the lessons that came to mind that I think would be useful in your own work if you haven't come across them in your own spaces. So <laughs> number one, let me just, I, the, all of that was an intro. Why, why should you like her work for your own work? Because her writing is fire. Because there's been, I'm sure that the people in this space have been a part of many conversations about how academic writing has so many problems from being exclusionary, from making up words and phrases, from um, not uh, understanding the people that they try to attract. Um, just look at the amount of people that read any research paper, what have you, right? Um, but one thing I wanted to do, if you all will compel me, um, is read some of the writing that she's done for you to give you an idea of what she's like. This will only take about a couple of minutes. Um, so if you could do me a favor and close your eyes after June Grant has entered into the waiting room, do me a favor and close your eyes and listen to me read some of her work. This is from the short story, The City Born Great. This is the lesson. Great cities are like any other living things being born and maturing and wearing and dying in their turn. Duh, right? Everyone who's visited a real city feels that one way or another. All those rural people who hate cities are afraid of something legit. Cities really are different. They make a weight on the world, a tear in the fabric of reality, like, like black holes maybe. Yeah, I go to museums sometimes. The cool inside and Neil deGrasse Tyson is hot. As more and more people come in and deposit their strangeness and leave and get replaced by others, the tear widens. Eventually it gets so deep that it forms a pocket connected by the only thinnest thread of something to 
something, whatever cities are made of. But the separation starts a process. And in that pocket, the many parts of the city begin to multiply and differentiate. Its sewers extend into places where there's no need for water. Its slums grow teeth, its art centers, claws. Ordinary things within it, traffic and construction and stuff like that, start to have a rhythm like a heartbeat. If you record their sound and play them back fast, the city quickens. Not all cities make it this far. There used to be a couple of great cities that had to start over. New Orleans failed, like Pablo said, but it survived. And that's something it can try again. Mexico City is well on its way. And New York is the first American city to reach this point. The gestation could take 20 years or 200 or 2000, but eventually the time will come. And just like in any other part of nature, there are things lying in wait for this moment, hoping to chase down the sweet new life and swallow its guts while it screams. That's why Paolo is here to teach me. That's why I can clear the city's breathing and stretch and massage its asphalt. I'm the midwife, see? She's so good. She's so good. She writes. She writes like a monster is what she does. Um, that's the first thing I loved about it because it teaches us how to write better, um, to compel people into emotion, into the work we're trying to accomplish. Number two, her ideas expand our imaginations. Imagination is the, it is one of the core capacities of anyone doing design work. Um, one of my favorite quotes, I'm sure we have all said or heard or seen in recently in the space, we can imagine the end of the world easier than we can imagine the end of capitalism, right? Um, so in these spaces, uh, it's critical to learn from people that spend all of their time imagining outside of the bounds of the worlds in which we currently exist. What you see right now is um, a very quick intro of a few of the stories that exist in um, this short story asset. People that can move mountains on instinct, a cultural utopia built on the backs of a dark secret, a girl that interacts with sky scientists correcting a destroyed atmosphere. You all can read, you all can see what's discussed here. There's many more where that came from. I just wanted to represent the idea that with these imaginations uh, disconnected from these struggles, the needs, the structures, the relationships that we, that we hold in our own space, um, we can better exercise our minds for um, the ways that how worlds can look and then therefore potentially make the connection between the world we sit and the world that could be created. This is, a, this is an important one that I loved hearing about. Um, because of my work, uh, because of reading her work and other different sci-fi artists, I started looking for resources to learn about how to write sci-fi fantasy. I'm trying to very slowly write a book of my own. Um, and core in this piece, in design communications, in um, talking with students and engaging with, um, with any type of design activity. Conflict is core to the activity. Uh, and communicating conflict is essential in any one of these activities. I found another very famous uh, author called Brandon Sanderson, um, who gives uh, an online course. Uh, he went to, he taught it at Brigham Young University on how to write stories. And a core part, uh, he brought in another person, I can't remember exactly her name, uh, Mary Robinette, I can't remember her last, last name, um, on short stories. Um, so she introduced me to the mice metaphor, the idea that in each of these conversations, there are, in a story, there are four main ways that you can easily categorize conflict for stories engaged with. Milieu, which means a place. Sometimes there's conflict related to a place. Think of this as like um, if you're in a maze trying to get out, or like my wife told me, if you're in, <laughs> almost like if you're in a house during a horror story and you're trying to get out of that house, the house is against you, right? Investigation is a murder mystery story. It's like Sherlock Holmes or the like. The conflict there is you're trying to, um, you have a question that you're trying to answer and all of the parts of the story are keeping the protagonist from understanding 
what the solution is um, to the problem, to the, um, to the murder, to the crime, to the issue, the mistake, right? Um, the who done it, what have you. A character story, however, uh, is there is a person that feels a deep gap or a struggle or a need within themselves. And the story, they're trying to fill that gap however they can. And the story is keep making ways to make them feel more insecure. These are romance stories. These are um, teen uh, growing up type stories. Um, these are, uh, in many ways, sometimes these are stories like Star Wars, where people have deep flaws or um, drama stories uh, where someone is uh, destroyed by the flaws in which they, that, that's endemic to them. An event story is usually something that you know the best well, the, um, the Joseph Campbell type stories uh, like Lord of the Rings, where you have to destroy the ring to defeat the end person. Um, to defeat the villain of the story. There's an event that is going on and the conflict ends when the people make the event stop. Um, I love these, this framing and it's useful for me in thinking about uh, other ways to design how to engage with conflict in our world. Another important thing is it teaches us how to study story logic. There's a lot of different logics that build out a story. I, I just recently mentioned uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, story frame. I'm forgetting the name. I just had it. Um, the, the Hero's Journey, that's the name of it. Um, there's another really powerful resource um, from somebody that's read a lot of different movie scripts and advised on it. His name is uh, Richard McKee, and he's wrote a book called Story. In each one of those spaces, um, there is a uh, discussion about how Clearly, everything in a story goes from beginning to end. There is a character that we care about, and the character goes through things that we're used to experiencing. The logic um, helps us understand these people that are far away from each other in a way that keeps us compelled to the story. Um, if a person receives a illicit drug in the back alley of a space and they have to do something to, um, to feed their family, or there's a uh, person that's going off into the great unknown, into space, and needs to learn more about uh, what's happening to um, save the people that he's close to at home. I just came up with those ideas, but the point here is every time you get exposed with the story, you start getting exposed to different pieces of how the story works, and the logic is critical to determine what makes sense. Um, one story from uh, Black future month that I love discussing is non-zero probabilities. That is basically a story of a protagonist living in a New York where probabilities are flipped on their heads, where things that rarely ever happen become commonplace and how it's affecting people living and breathing every single day, whether or not they live at um, a, oh my goodness, the name of it is leaving me. Um, whether or not you gamble or work at a casino or whether or not you um, work on the stock market uh, and what happens in these spaces and how would that affect a protagonist in these environments. This is one of my favorite ones. It requires you to understand how cultures are built. In sci-fi, in fantasy, especially in fantasy, a core piece of being able to tell a story well, um, a core tenant of it is usually it's distance from our world that in which we sit. It's usually one jump away, um, one single jump so that we can understand how the story works, but everything else around the story usually uses um, logics that we can understand. For instance, not only uh, the physics of a space or how people interact with each other, whether they care or don't care about each other, but how cultures are built. And one core piece of cultures that we need to understand is that humans are illogical in building them. There's a lot of different ways that cultures have been built that people try to say, oh, why don't they just use it in this way, rationally, economically, um, <laughs> of being, being distance observers, and that's not how they were built. For instance, the idea of syncretism. Um, syncretism is the idea that cultures from the past 
evolve, connect, and build in unique and interesting ways um, together. So in the same way that you might see um, Atlantis at the bottom of the sea um, that's been living and evolving for years and years and um, it's broken down and there's algae in the areas, but you can still make out um, some of the, uh, some of the, the symbols on the pillars and what have you, the, the things that are culturally based, build, evolve, and construct foundations for the future. Economy, for instance, is obviously how humans uh, decide to amass and distribute resources. So when you're building a culture, you have to critically understand what are the resources of that economy, not just what they, um, what they eat, what they drink, uh, but what knowledge they decide to use, um, what places they decide to engage in, what people care about, what they don't, um, and not only rationally how an economy should work in this space, but irrationally how humans try to exploit those researchers for resources for those ends, whether or not they have power or they don't. Cosmogony, the idea, a, a, a subcategory of this is understanding religion. So understanding where we came from as a uh, community, and then through that, how that affects the decisions people try to make. If you're a part of an Abrahamic religion, a deep, uh, there's a lot of fantasy uh, information about Christianity um, and about other cultures and spaces on that. That's the, that is the main um, religion in which I've been acculturated and sit, so I understand a lot of those perspectives. But so many other pieces of um, different communities saying this is where the world came from, and this is where we go when we die, and this is what we believe, where the sky is and what the ground means, um, critically affects how people make decisions in their world. Um, the last piece is differentiation. Uh, it is your culture made certain decisions about how it operates based on how other people do different things. So this is the we versus them perfect situation. Um, there are many different situations that can come to mind, Democrats versus Republicans, um, the uh, communities of Pluriversal design versus the Elon Musk acolytes, what have you, right? Um, but each cultural uh, community makes decisions about what it values, how it engages with each other, and how they communicate and what they do with that information differently than others. Um, in some ways, uh, that's one of the main uh, influences for how different cultures get built. We are different from them, therefore we are better because X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Another piece, building a world means you must know how ours works very well. Um, to be a good fantasy author, you have to be a fantastic researcher. A perfect example is one story in this book, Broken Earth. Um, right, one story in this that refers to the Broken Earth trilogy and this one um, also, uh, has created a world where the humans can move mountains on instinct. And to be able to do that, you have to know mountains. You're actually looking at a part of a uh, paper written by a Berkeley professor on her ability to create world buildings and what it, what it means in doing this space from sensing on Rocky matter events uh, and tectonic shifts, feeling the formation of fault lines, knowing the contours of each creek, stream, and river, Going deep into how those things work means that you can live the life and tell the story from the, from the perspective of the character. One caution though, that I wanna add in and critically understand. It makes sense that world building is popular to designers. However, world building actually might be one of the least important things for a storyteller to accomplish. Is important. It's critical for people to, to engage with. But what actually makes more sense and you have to do much better is characterize. You have to learn how to build with your characters because those are the people that you're following. You have to learn how to build a story structure. Um, you have to build compelling emotional um, relationships with those people and then let the world building serve that need. 
And I think that's a powerful lesson for us trying to understand the needs that we're trying to accomplish as designers, as we're trying to shape new and better worlds. So another core thing that I learn and build from, from the futurist communities I've engaged with a, a few of those spaces for a while is um, understanding that the stories we'll tell guides the world that we want to build. And I learned from this from a, from a friend, uh, her name is Monica Bielskite, if you know her as Protopia Futures, um, the founder of that concept. The idea that many of our world is built on dystopias as product roadmaps. The direct example she likes discussing is, um, there's a Tom Cruise movie, uh, Minority Report. If you know it well, one thing that you might see them doing, the idea is he's walking um, in a mall with a lot of different screens coming up to him. And over time, he looks at the screens, they, they uh, scan his eye and they say, hello, I think his name is Mark. They say, hello, Mark, wouldn't you like this thing? Wouldn't you like this resource? Another person says, hello, Mark, don't you like this makeup? And he keeps going down and they start attaching to him directly, right? And everyone that's moving through the space, they attach to them directly. In the early 2000s, this was utterly ridiculous that this was built in this way. Today, and over the past five or 10 years, our world has been deeply affected by um, online services doing ridiculously specific ad curation to us. Um, building up what was done in the past affects the people that are creating innovations for the future. And we continue to do that, especially thinking of all of the ways that the world is becoming more dystopian and the stories about, for instance, Mar Martian colonization um, gives people an idea of what sciences they should try to create. So I said a lot, I said too much, I took too much time. But what I wanted to do is take a little bit of time and crash course in the idea of world building. And for this, I would love for people to communicate however they would like, if that's in um, voice, if that's in the chat, what have you. I'm going to facilitate a quick crash course in world building, specifically on that idea in the past that I just discussed, building a fantasy roadmap. So what I want to do to start with, I want folks to think of a fantasy slash sci-fi story you love. Take a second and think of one that you love and appreciate. As you do so, I'm gonna describe this one that you see on the screen. I love anime, I love manga. This is a story modeled after Dante's Inferno of climbers that go down into a deep abyss. They have no idea how old, how, old, how complex, how unique it is to find treasures and each level gives them a new, um, as they go up through the abyss, something horrible happens to the body depending on how far they've gone down in the first place. That's my example. I'd love to hear others, other people's examples. Um, one that I really like is uh, called All Systems Red, uh, and it's about a robot human construct that's uh, built as a security guard who's overridden its uh, governing module and has the capacity to uh, commit mass murder, but instead just wants to watch uh, TV shows and uh, soap operas. And it's all about <laughs> trying to find its place in the world and uh, avoid having to be controlled. Interesting. Yo, that's, a, that's fire. Um, it's called All Systems Red, you said? Yeah, it's a novella and it's part of a series called the Murderbot series. Murderbot, I know about Murderbot. I want to hear more about, I want to read that. I'm glad you like it too. It's um, really good. I'd love to hear another person's. Um, okay, Fiona said um, in the chat, I read Solars with my dad when I was a young kid and saw the Tartovsky movie later, still remains one of my favorites. Fiona, if you could, um, could you tell me what the uh, story is about very uh, quickly? Yeah. Are you hear, hear me at all? Sorry, what? Are you able to hear me? No. We, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I wanted to. So my point is, I, I, I read, the thing that comes to mind is I read the uh, 
Carlos Castaneda's series, Teach, Teachings of Don Juan. And that's as close as I've come to, to uh, fantasy. So I'll throw that out there. Appreciate it. I deeply appreciate it. I'm definitely going to have to check that one out. Um, Fiona, what were you going to say? Yeah, Solaris is, a, it was written by a, a Polish author, um, Stanis, Stanisław Lem. Um, and it was, it's a short read. It's a story about um, astronauts who discover this planet called Solaris. Um, and they're studying, they create like an academic study called uh, Solar, Solar Netics, I think it's called. Um, and it follows the story of one man who's, um, they're losing funding for the project because they're not able to learn about this planet. The planet's very mysterious. The planet itself is a conscious being and interacts mm -hmm. with the astronauts um, in very interesting and deeply emotional, mentally um, invasive in a way, but also very human and unhuman ways. Um, I, you know, I don't want to say too much without revealing sort of the big plot twist behind it, but it is um, very much a story of what it means to be human, what it means to hold memory, and the planet itself is to, to interact. It was the first story I ever read where the planet itself is, is like a conscious living being and what that would look like, what that would mean for our exploration of space and contact. The author said that it was a story about when first contact goes terribly wrong. Um, yeah. And I've always been fascinated by that ever since. And the Tarkovsky movie is very visually amazing and will have you thinking about it for many days. I love it. I'm a fan. What I want to do is, these are fantastic story examples. I want people to keep their story in their mind. Also, these stories that were discussed, these could um, address issue number two, question number two. What I want to do is for you to think about that story's element X. Fiona just did a perfect example of that just now. Um, in sci-fi and fantasy, traditionally, there usually is something that exists in the story that couldn't exist in our world. For example, like a sentient world. Well, we could, we could make that case about the Earth, whether or not it's sentient or not, what have you, right? But let's just say like the way that they uh, fed feedback into human identity experience, what have you, that is the element X. One very simple example from a story that I love, it's called Avatar The Last Airbender. The element X here is humans have the ability to bend the elements. That is earth, that is fire, that is water, that is wind. And they created a very fantastic um, system that the world is built around about what it means to do that and how it becomes um, based in religion, how it's based in the economics, how it's based in how people interact with each other. So what I wanna do is hear from other people what your story's element X is. Yes, that absolutely is. I love the left hand of darkness, especially the last part when they're on the ice. I, it's amazing. Um, the beings being androgynous is definitely an element X. If I remember how it's told, um, it's a core piece of the story. Um, the a that's definitely uh, an example that we could definitely use. Um, I'd love to hear other people's ideas of element X's they love hearing. Necromacy. Tell me more. Is it like the ability to control death or dead people? Uh, it's the ability to create uh, skeleton constructs. So um, wow. certain people are able to um, use bones and um, sort of wield them as elements like an avatar. Got it. Understood. And so specifically bones, kind of though. Mm -hmm. Specifically bones. And so it changes the people's relationships to death and, and what is powerful in terms of death Ooh. and life. Heavy. I like that. I love that. Um, I love that so much. I usually, with more time and space, 
Um, I would love for us to decide together which one they want to do because I like the idea of necromis necromancy so much how it's described here. I'm gonna run with that one. And I'm gonna ask the next question on how to build worlds. Um, thank you for giving me that example. The next one is, I want us collectively to imagine, to come up with ideas of if that element X was dropped into our world immediately, right now, like boom, uh, the ability of necromancy happens. Um, how might it affect our society, our technologies, our economy, our political atmosphere, and our environment? To help facilitate this question, what I think would be very useful is, I'm trying to go up to um, Morgan. I would love if you could say a bit about how um, necromancy affects that world um, in Gideon the Ninth. Could you help us? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this is a futuristic world where there's space travel and um, it's set on the nine planets in our solar system 10,000 years in the future. Um, and so there's a, um, a big um, difference between this necromancy, which is very um, uh, magical and spiritual, and then the uh, futuristic technology of uh, spaceships and things. And there's a bit of a separation, but um, for uh, society, people who practice necromancy are um, sort of um, considered, um, uh, have higher places in society and are protected by um, sort of security and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, they use uh, sort of uh, necromancy as uh, political tools, as uh, things like that, but also as historical uh, ways of connecting to history and um, being able to like learn from the past and the past people. So some people use it as just tools for uh, fighting or for protection and some people use it as tools for learning and for studying. Understood. Appreciate that deeply. Um, so I'd love to ask other people based on that, that definition um, and how it was used there. Let me say in this story we're building, everyone immediately becomes a necromancer the way that that was described. How might that affect how we engage with each other as humans? Could we hear the definition uh, briefly one more time? Yeah, um, so it would mean that everybody on Earth uh, would have the ability to uh, use bones as a material to uh, raise the dead and create constructs that can move about and do things. Um, and uh, yeah, be able to um, create beings that they are able to control and puppet. Um, mm, interesting. I have some thoughts, um, or I guess some having not read uh, this story, but I feel like there are a lot of different ways you could take this, even kind of just going through that list of like society technology, right? So if you can bring people back from the dead, can you have conversations with them about the context in which they lived, um, finding out what was historically true or historically false, um, uh, you know, using past information for current advantage or future advantage. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I don't know. Then there's just more of the sort of like utilitarian purpose of like you building armies to like um, hurt people um, or, you know, maybe, actually you could have these um, folks be benevolent and like help provide um, services um, to communities that are traditionally neglected. I mean, I just, you could, I, you could go so many different ways with this. You, they could be enslaved and like do labor, right? Which is like horrible, but mm. yeah. Very much so. Um, my mind immediately went to hierarchy like right like so many different ways if everyone has the ability to do something real. then how will humans try to say that someone is doing something better than others um 
like will there be competitions for people that try to do um, necromancy the right way? And what does the right way even look like in our world? Like, can you make more money off of the bones that you build, or can you can you perform it in the Olympics better? Does it become an Olympic sport? You know. What comes to my mind? Uh, several things. One is uh, this could be a metaphor for what we now now call heaven, right? We all have talked mm. for centuries about dying and going to heaven. So what if all of our deadness uh, over the entire existence of, of humanity? finds itself alive again, bones uh, re, um, uh, reconstituted into a new living. Would that describe what we fantasize as heaven? Question number one. Question number two is, um, I think about, and this is along the lines that I think Alvin um, was saying, uh, what if you were able to, with a positive sense or negative, uh, actual, actualize or activate all of the uh, enslaved over history, creating an army, what would that do? Uh, that could be a premise. And then the question is, does the necromancy require that you physically do something with one set of bones or is it a capacity that allows you to uh, move across time and across distance to uh, both capture and engage bones? So those are questions. Yeah, that <laughs> that heaven one. I'm gonna keep thinking about that for a long time. Um, there's so many questions that everyone is asking in the chat, and every single one of those, I argue, could turn into a new story to keep things moving forward. The final question I wanted to ask um, was: Let's take one of these examples and think of if we were in this world, what could a protagonist, you, another person you're thinking about, let's say if we were creating um, necromancy armies, what would they do to try to make the world a better place in this society? What if uh, necromancy armies were uh, teachers uh, imbued with a, um, a mission of teaching, teaching being the concept of sharing knowledge and pathways to individual enlightenment where there is a genuine um, objective of enabling the living, the natural living to uh, arrive at uh, self-realization and that uh, the creations uh, would be intentionally uh, designed to guide the living to each individual's fulfillment. And that fulfillment then leads to a reordering of the way humanity uh, engages, works with, interacts with uh, wind, water, air, uh, minerals, resources, and uh, each other uh, in a way that's fair, balanced, and that is based on justice and cooperation. Yeah, that's the sense that, that's, that's fire. I love that idea. I wanna ask for one more respecting understanding time if anyone has any guiding and helping us all see and deal with our traumas like if we could speak to our past and our past ancestors and what have you death doulas coming to be y'all y'all so smart <laughs> and i love the the fact that people are saying it in the chat so that we can move um what I wanted to do is we are out of time, unfortunately, for the space. I want to just say the last piece of information. What we just did is effectively what our world just experienced. Our element X was COVID. Um, everyone is using metaphors to better understand how we've engaged with COVID and what have you. Um, but as we try to build out a better world, these reasons, these practices, and these exercises can help us understand this is what a world can look like. How can we build out a world, um, other worlds, multiple spaces in which many worlds fit um, that are different than the world in which we sit today. I thank you for your time. Um, if you wanna learn more about the work that we try to accomplish or work I've amassed, you can go to this bit.ly link. I can put it in the, I can give it a resource to 
Leslie afterwards so people can see a lot of different design, liberation, equity, um, justice resources that we've amassed um, at Think Rubik's, and then a lot of papers that we've written to help support this work um, in the past and what we will do in the future. Thank you for your time. I appreciate how much work you all put into this space. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm just like, everyone give you a fantastic clap. Um, amazing. That was amazing. I have like notes and notes and notes, and I normally just listen, but I was like, I can't let these things pass. And um, I mean, we're at time. If people want to stay on, they can. If we want to um, just have a little bit of chit chat, I don't know what your time is like, Pierce. But firstly, you know, within the time, I want to say thank you for. Um, bringing N.K. Jemison's work and the whole concept of world building to us. Um, I've known what I want to do with Afrofuturism, but just in this tiny session, you made it crystal clear really how I could do, you know, how I could do the next thing. So I'm going to reach out to you to talk about that. Um, so this is our last session for this. Well, you know, we're academics, so we work in an academic year. So this is our last session for this academic year. Um, over the next few weeks, we're going to be working on our YouTube channel where we're actually going to have all of the sessions I counted. Um, we have done like maybe about 20 ses sessions over the last two years. So um, we'll be emailing people for each session telling them, well, hey, the YouTube um, video is up. You can actually look at it. So by the end of um, the Northern Hemisphere summer, you'll have access to all of these, um, all of these videos. And then we should start back um, maybe in September or the end of August um, this year, we'll start back our our stuff so think about it if you want to if you want a book that um if you want to present a book let us know if you want to suggest a book to us um let us know but uh have a great um a great summer break everyone all right <laughs>